Hi everyone, uh, Raghu Marcus. I'm back with Mind Rolling. I've got an old friend on the show today who's been here before, Judith Orloff. Judith, welcome. Thank you. The subject today is empathy and empathy and, and sensitive uh, people. Uh, I love this. Uh, can I read this quote from Krishnamurti? I, I have an advanced copy of what uh, Judith is working on. The people who are sensitive in life may suffer much more than those who are insensitive. But if they understand and go beyond their suffering, they will discover extraordinary things. And this is Jiddu Krishnamurti. I love that. Yes, yes. Well, in the book, I took beautiful quotes like that, and I used them as space holders in between the texts, talking about empaths and sensitivity, because that quote in and of itself you can meditate on for days yeah well t talk about uh, well tell us a little bit about what is an empath or a very sensitive person uh, and what was the re i mean you're you have a very large constituency who who reads your books and so on and i don't know what percentage of the public are empaths but I'm sure, and in my going through some of the book, um, I found things that I thought would, that really could have applied to me in my own life, although I'm don't, not sure I'd be called an empath. Maybe a sense of, although I want to go through this test with you in a minute, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because you got it in there. Yeah, go through the test. <laughs> yeah. But um, tell us about uh, and what is an empath and, and your reasons for writing this book. Well, I wrote the Empath Survival Guide because I wanted to legitimize the experience of empathy. And there's an, a spectrum of being an empath. There's the ordinarily sensitive person who wants to stay open-hearted and avoid compassion burnout. Um, so you need to learn skills how to really protect yourself and still be contributing compassionately and open-heartedly to the world. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then it goes to the other end of the spectrum of being a full-blown empath. And an empath is somebody like myself. I have such an interest in it because I am one. And I've had to really learn techniques to protect myself or else get demolished by the world. Really, I mean, it's that clear. Um, but an empath is somebody who is extremely sensitive, intuitive, open, um, but tends to not have the same defenses as other people. They absorb all the stress and negative energy of the world into their own body. And they can get exhausted, be misdiagnosed with all kinds of things. And the psychiatrist will see this chronic fatigue fibromyalgia, panic disorder, agoraphobia. Some won't even go out of the house because it's just too overwhelming. And so being an empath, you have extraordinary intuition. There, in the book, I talk about plant empaths, empaths who can communicate with plants, and earth empaths who know about the movements of the earth in their own bodies. Um, all different kinds of empaths, telepathic empaths where you can – really sense other people's thoughts, precognitive empaths who can predict the future because they're so sensitive that they get into to the non-space, non-time continuum and just get on the, you know, the matrix of beingness, basically. They can pick. And so there's a whole spectrum from being a lovely, sensitive person who wants to protect your abilities to really having some pretty extraordinary intuition and intuitive abilities. But my objection to what science has done with empaths is that they call it um, a sensory disorder. They've put in a disorder already, you know, which oh, just, really? oh, yeah, a sensory processing disorder. That's what science calls it. And this is not a disorder. And I wish they'd stop making beautiful things into disorders. No, this is a gift. It's a sensory gift that you need to learn how to manage mm -hmm. and appreciate and embrace and learn techniques such as grounding, shielding, setting clear boundaries, being in nature, all kinds of things to protect yourself so that you can really nurture the gift. It's not a disorder, and it just drives me crazy that they take these beautiful human perceptual capacities and pathologize them. 
and probably put some of them into institutions as well. That's so. true. They lock them up. They medicate them. They make them feel terrible about themselves, like there's something wrong with them. I have an empath support community on Facebook with over 5,000 empaths, and they all say they've been pathologized, and thank God I found a place where I see not only is it normal, it's a gift. Hmm. And so the reason I wrote this book was just to transmit that to as many people who can hear that, that if you're sensitive, know things of people, or you get overloaded in crowds and you prefer being alone, it's a particular emotional type called an empath. And you need to nurture that and teach others around you how to love you and take care of you as well. Hmm. But you know, our society, which is so over-intellectualized, you know, just sees everything as a product of the mind and if it can't be reduced to the mind or some kind of statistical scientific study, it's either pathologized or it doesn't exist. And I personally feel that empathy will save the world. This is the one quality we need to develop, whether you're an empath or where you are on the spectrum of sensitivity. We need empathy to be able to feel what our, quote, enemies our needing and feeling so we can empathize with them, not just say us and them and divide us from them. If we don't have empathy, I'm just afraid for our world mm. if we can't develop this critical skill. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so here's the, uh, you have in the book the empath self-assessment deal here. So <laughs> I, I want to go through it a little bit and then you're going to advise me. I mean, okay. Because I, have I have I been labeled as overly sensitive, shy, or introverted? Now, in my life, I have been labeled as that. Yeah. That doesn't seem to be the case now that I have, you know, I, for many years teaching or having a podcast or doing whatever, it's chanting in public. <laughs> so, uh, but that certainly was a, a very, very, uh, that is a part of my nature, so uh, I can't deny that. Um, do you frequently get overwhelmed and anxious? No, I don't, so I don't qualify there. Uh, do arguments or yelling make me ill? Any loud, anybody who takes off on me, like yelling, forget about it. I, I get very right. disturbed. And right. that, you know, I always figured it came from my poor old dad, but uh, who knows, you know. Uh, do I often feel like I don't fit in? Well, when I was younger in school and all of that, I did not fit in whatsoever, okay? Right, right, right. Uh, am I drained by crowds and need, need alone time to revive myself? Uh, I would say, uh, yeah, big crowds, uh, I, I prefer to be alone uh, uh, much of the time, although I don't mind crowds. Uh, I'm uh, overstimulated by noise, odors, and nonstop talkers. I am so done with nonstop talkers, too. Me, too. Oh, Jesus. As an empath, they just drive me crazy. The words are like bullets that come at you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really. look at them with dread, but... In the book, I talk about what do you do when you're around one. You have to learn what to do. You cannot let them go on and on and on. It's damaging. <laughs> do I have a chemical? Oh, this is getting bad now. I mean, not bad. This is good. See, I have this in my head, too. You know, uh, chemical insensitivities or can't, can't tolerate scratchy clothes. I cannot wear wool. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no reason for it, right. but I can't do it. Okay. Right. Do I prefer taking my own car places so I can leave early if I... I prefer being somewhere on time, I'll tell you that. That's for sure. Oh. Uh, I don't overeat to cope with stress. Uh, uh, am I becoming uh, suffocated by intimate... Rela now, I could say that I have, in the past, become suffocated by intimate relationships. I fortunately married a goddess named Saraswati, so that will tell yes. you everything. Yes. Uh, I don't startle easily. Uh, of course, if my dog, who's uh, sitting right behind me, starts to bark right now, that I will get startled. Uh, right. Jump? Huh? Do you jump? No, no like jumping. Like, no, you know, I, no, I do this. What? <laughs> right, right. But that's, that's a something, simple. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, low pain threshold. Um, moderately so. Do I react strongly to caffeine or medications? No, don't. But I'm not drinking any now. Uh, socially isolate? No. Do I absorb other people's stress, emotions, or symptoms? Now, in a relationship, and I want to talk about this in a bit, that yeah. definitely goes on. 
I, I, I am definitely absorbing my partner's stress and emotions or symptoms, okay? That's right. going on. Am I overwhelmed by multitask? No, I consider myself to be a fantastic multitasker. Not so, you know, that there's a downside to that as well. Do I replenish myself in na- absolutely every day? I go out there. Nature. Yeah, nature is totally important. Do I need yeah. a long time to recuperate after being with a difficult uh, person or energy vampires? Energy vampires, we need to talk about that as yes. well. Uh, I don't think I need a long time, but certainly something. Do I feel better in small cities? Well, I'm in the country now, and I feel a hell of a lot better than I was in L.A., living right. nearby where you live now. Right. Uh, and uh, do I prefer one-to-one interactions or small groups rather than line to Yeah, I like small groups. So, okay, what's my verdict, Judith? Well, it sounds like you answered yes to about 13 or 14 of the questions. Yep. And so it shows you you're moderately an empath. Okay. You're not full full blown. A full blown empath would answer yes to all those. I mean, all I right. answer yes to all, all those of like uh-huh. triple times. Really? <laughs> <laughs> now I walk by. I'm such an empath. I walk by a street um, in, on Wilshire the other day, and the traffic signal had a voice, and it said, "Don't walk, don't walk, don't walk." And <laughs> You know, because I'm so sensitive, whereas another person would walk by and not maybe not even hear it. You know, that's the difference between a really sensitive empath. You know, that makes me jump. It startles me to hear a loud voice over my shoulder. Yeah. Whereas other people were walking, they weren't startled. Yeah, right. So just have this open sensitivity. I was born with not the same kind of defenses as other people. You know, I just haven't had the same guardedness, nor have I wanted to develop it. Because part of my spiritual practice is learning how to be vulnerable and open, um, but learning how to protect myself so that I'm not demolished by the outside Mara world, the material world. Right. And certainly in this book, by the way, uh, which will be out next year, uh, there is a lot of practical applications for people to use to yeah. actually transform themselves in these kinds of situations. And right. I like this too. Some empaths have profound spiritual and intuitive experiences, which aren't usually associated with highly sensitive people. Some are able to communicate with animals, as you said before, nature, right. and to me, more important than anything, their inner guides. But being a highly sensitive person and an empath are not mutually exclusive. You can be both at the same time. But, but uh, that reality of, of being able to connect with your inner guide, of course, you know my history and Ram Dass and Krishna Das and all of it, you know, in our time in India and meeting that inner guide on, a, on, a, on the physical plane was an extraordinary thing. Um, right. And I think, though, that um, probably all of us that were there, there may be a... I mean, uh, certainly there was maybe a couple of hundred Westerners, when you think back on it, wow, that's not a lot of people, that made it over there and, and physically saw this being. Um, but I think they all had to have a very sensitively tuned place to be able to open up in a way that, uh, first of all, you could actually meet someone like that, but then uh, then then begin the transformation process. Uh, right. You know, uh, for for your own self and and be able to connect with that. So I think that you know I kept thinking about when I, you know, as I went through the book, uh, of all of the things as I said before, which are such practical uh, applications that you don't. I mean, I th- I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that just if we we're not necessarily talking about an empath now, but we are talking about a sensitivity. Yes. Uh, and it, through that sensitivity, everybody can empathize with yes. what's going around around them, okay. right? And that sensitivity can be expanded upon and opened up so that some of the things that you're talking about here that are endemic to an empath can be productively uh, used uh, by a quote-unquote, by everybody, because everybody's got a sensitive place in them. Is that not... Everybody has an empath within, and the more you develop your spiritual path and the more you develop your intuition, the still small voice inside that tells you the truth about things, the more your radar can extend into universal truths, and the more you can pick up in terms of telepathy and future and 
being able to sense, you know, to receive Shaktipat or be able to receive energy. You know, intuition and empathy allows you to sense subtle energy in yourself and around you. That's the plus of being an empath and a sensitive person and a minus because you go into a shopping mall and all those energy fields overlap and an empath without any defenses or tools is just flattened by it. Yeah. There's so much information that's transmitted in our energy fields, and empaths can feel all of it, and then it's just translated into their bodies as anxiety or depression or panic attacks because it's really a lot to deal with without tools. So in our society, these beautiful people called empaths or sensitive people or someone just wanting to develop empathy, you need to learn how not to burn out. It's very easy to burn out in our culture, and we need you. We need all the sensitivity we can that you can give us and contribute to the world, because if you shut off and you don't develop this, it's not going to be useful for everyone, the collective. It's yeah. not. And people intellectually wall off, and that's not going to be helpful to, for this planet. Yeah. Um, let's talk about... Uh a few of the things that that you uh, pointed out in, uh, in the book that I that I that are things that we talk about and we have talked about before, not just with you but other guests that I've had, uh, mm -hmm. and it's certainly uh, in this particular case it's the mirror neuron system, and right. uh, and of course that's that's used a lot around the whole mindfulness topic and right. and the ways in which we can uh, retrain our habitual tendencies. Can you t just talk about the, that uh, mirror neuron and and how it relates to not just em empaths but all of us in terms of being able to use it uh, productively? Right. Well, there's a section in the book on the scientific causes and reasons for empathy and why certain people have more empathy than others and have more sensitivity than others. And the mirror neurons are these incredible neurons in our brain that allow us to feel compassion and allow us to feel what's going on in other people. That's why they're called mirrors, because it mirrors what goes on in other people so we can feel it, and especially those we love. And so it's been proven if your loved one is hurt, you feel it on in your own body as evidenced in MRI scans. So it's about a reciprocal empathy of I feel your pain, which isn't always good. You know, I'm not saying that that's always good or beneficial for the empaths, but the mirror neuron system allows us to facilitate that empathy for and not just our loved ones, as that's what we're programmed to do more in our brains, but to extend that compassion to all living things and all sentient beings. That's the beauty of the mirror neuron system is to connect with everything, not just the ones in your, your sphere or your personal life or the ones you love. Because, of course, it's easier to tune into the ones you love. It's easier to sense and feel the ones you love. But Everyone and the planet and the earth, we all can be earth empaths with our mirror neuron system. That's all it takes is our sensitivity being turned on to feel what the earth, a living being, spirit, mother, is feeling. That's all it takes. We, we can do it. And our intellectual mind tells us we can't. And that is such a travesty. It just breaks my heart because it's so untrue. But through empathy, we can feel the earth. And once you feel the earth, she's your co-partner in existence. I mean, she always has been, but empathy and sensitivity let you really know that viscerally in your body, that the earth is you, you are the earth. And there's deep love. The earth loves us. Deep love for humanity. And we don't, we have to feel that. And we can't think it, you know, we might know it in our heads, but it's not enough. We have to feel that connection to our grounding, our planet, that beautiful, beautiful planet that um, Edgar Mitchelson had a spiritual experience looking down. He was an astronaut looking down at the Earth, and he opened up and had his first spiritual experience looking at the blue planet. You know, and um, empathy helps us get there. And as you can see, I feel so strongly about it because I see it as an answer. Yes. Uh, and certainly, we need some answers these days. To yeah. Um, but that that ties right into the, the, this other thing around electromagnetic fields that the brain and heart have, and and certainly that field is the Earth has that field. And That's right. I guess you're talking here about connecting the two. Tell us about that. 
I am, that we give off um, electromagnetic fields around our heart, as is represented by an EKG, um, and around our brain, as is documented by an EEG. When you are hooked up to an EEG, you see your electricity, your electromagnetic fields in your body. So that is connected to the electromagnetism around the earth and around other people. And so one of the theories of being an empath and sensitive person is that you're able to sense the electromagnetic fields of other people and information is transmitted via these fields. Mm. And so it's just another way of communicating deeply with others, the earth, plants, um, you know, on all different levels, not just on a linear level either, on a spiritual level. That when you really open up, and this is why I wrote the book, to all these levels of communication in yourself, when you can develop them, protect them, and not be thrown off when other people raise their eyebrows and say, oh, you must be kidding, you know, or oh, poor thing, you're an empath, you're so sensitive, you know, you need to be stronger. You know, that is not true. None of that. It's false, false, false. And when you reprogram yourself to know that and you can communicate really deeply, um, you have no idea what's possible. I'm only good because you're communicating with love. You're opening up. You're making a choice. I'm communicating with the love in me and the love in you and in the now. Um, and then the next now, the next moment, and then the next now. You know, all attuned, but at the same time, smart and protected. So you're not just ravaged by energy vampires and all the coarse energies in this world because there are so many of them. You walk out your door and I, I live in... Los Angeles, although I live in the Venice Canals, which is a very enchanted, protected community that was getting very crowded as well, you know, you have to learn how to deal with the energies of people unless you want to go in the country, but still you have to deal with the energies of people when you go into town, you know. So these skills that I talk about in the book are really useful for me. They're life-saving for my own life. Otherwise, I would be flat out on a bed exhausted all the time from everything. I think they're, they're useful across the board. Again, yeah. I, keep, uh, I keep bringing that up because I found so much in here. I mean, not knowing I'm a, I, mean, I, I know I'm a sensitive person, but most people have that. Most people, uh, many, I mean, maybe Donald Trump is pushing his sensitivity away these days, <laughs> to maybe, but, uh, but uh, most people do have that. And uh, uh, this other thing that's really interesting is the emotional contagion. And, right. Um, right. and we experience that. Uh, we have these uh, retreats in Maui that yeah. uh, we get together with Ramdas and other people, uh, and uh, you know, that whole group gets just this this contagion happens right and everybody opens up into that one place so it's a perfect example of what you're talking about here uh and uh and i do tell people myself when they're looking for something to help transform their lives find a group you know through a yoga studio or through a chanting thing or whatever or through meditation groups whatever it is right and in that group you can share in that space and then that will absolutely help to transform uh, you know, lots of stuff from the oh, inside no. out, not just. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so in the book, I talk about how to form your own empath support group if you want to. Hmm. And I'm really supporting people in doing that or, you know, even a group of five to ten people or three or four people to talk about your experiences, to practice the tools in the book, to learn how to develop the strengths that you need as an empath without shutting off your heart. You know, it's very important to have the community as you're discussing. Yeah. Uh, and and. The last one of these things that I found interesting, because I never heard of this word, and you've got to explain <laughs> it, uh, and, and maybe I don't even know how to say it, synesthesia. 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 Yeah. Synesthesia. I never heard that. And, and, oh, really? Touch synesthesia. Oh, my God. you got to tell us what that is. Yeah, that's another scientific explanation of, of what happens to our neurological system with empathy. The synesthesia, there are many different kinds, and there are many creative, famous people who are synesthetics, you know, where they um, play music and see color, where the different really? senses pair together. Yeah, there are many, you know, really creative people who have been synesthetic. I, I I'll have to double-check on that. So, 
Um, but mirror touch synesthesia is where you can feel the sensation of other people in your own body. So you're mirroring what they're feeling. If someone touches them, you can feel the touch. I mean, that's an extreme example. Or if somebody is upset, you actually feel their upsetness in your own body. Right. You know, or if somebody is really joyous, you get a wave of joy in your own body. So you're vibing, basically, with their bodies and their emotions in a synesthetic way. Hmm. That's like a, a billion percent empathetic. Yeah. No, but it, it, it is and it isn't. I mean, I think many of us are synesthetics and don't know it. I think it's just not popular in our culture. I've done some interviews for, you know, columnists on synesthesia. It's a very rare, you know, and more talked about lately thing. But I think it's very relevant if you want to understand sensitivity. You know, that if, you know, that we're built in such a way where our sensitivities can do a lot of things that we're not accessing. And one of those things is being a synesthetic. I mean, have, these people who are synesthetics talk about going to a, a Mozart concert and seeing red and yellow and green and you know, it's like a you know panoply wow. of colors yeah. amazing yeah. okay switching gears a little bit here and I, I told you I wanted to talk about uh, relationships a, a little bit uh, and you do have this chapter about how to stop absorbing other people's distress right which isn't particularly about relationships but I'm pointing this about relationships because um, that seems to be a primary issue in couples, especially couples, um, but also people that you work with and, and so on, is absorbing their distress. Right. Um, so let's talk about that, please. Yeah, I mean, that's, there is a chapter on relationships um, and empaths that, where I talk about how it's so hard for many sensitive be in a relationship um, and they often come to me in my psychiatric practice wanting to find their soulmate but not being able to find their soulmate and when I take a deeper history of it you know it's that they are afraid of finding their soulmate because they're afraid of getting suffocated and they don't know how to set boundaries in a relationship because when they're, then when they're in relationship empaths and sensitive people can lose themselves in the other person and pick up all their stuff and so subliminally, there's a motivation to stay away or they're attracted to unavailable people because the same challenges aren't there if the person holds themselves distant for an empath in a way that's safer, but it doesn't give us the intimacy we need. So that's the conundrum. And so my primary skill, I've been in a relationship for a few years now, which is a record for me because I really no, I'm pretty, you know, like a hermit and yeah. I write and I'm, I like my, I'm quiet you know, I don't like a lot of emotional processing. You know, I like to process at times, but I'm not constantly talking. Anyways, my needs as an empath are pretty specific. And if I don't get them met, I don't feel well. So I don't have a lot of room to, to move in it, you know, for my own comfort level. Um, but I'm with a partner now who is very understanding. He's not an empath, but he's willing to work with me on this and understand me. But the biggest challenge I have is absorbing his stress. You know, he's going through something. I've never learned the skill how not to absorb my partner's stress enough where I could sustain a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. And so that's my meditation practice now, you know, is not absorbing his stress and learning to separate myself from him empathically so that he can feel whatever he feels and it's it doesn't go into my own body. And I do that through breath work. I do that through meditation. I do that through, I mean, Al-Anon, where I talk about, you know, my own feelings and Al-Anon and learning how to be in relationships and let go with love so I'm not constantly trying to fix somebody. Mm, that's so, a big one. Empaths are fixers. They want to get in. They see a problem. You know, I'm a doctor. I'm a physician. I'm so good at fixing people that you can't do that in relationships. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't work. And then I end up taking on all the stuff. And then I think, oh, can I be in a relationship? I really need to be alone. And that's part of what I write about in the book, the conundrum, how I've always wanted to be alone. And I've always wanted to be in a relationship. And that's the conundrum <laughs> of an empath in love. Uh, and cool. that's what I'm working through in myself and what I present in the book for strategies for people who are in that same conundrum. And I think it's pretty common. I really do. In the book you say, if you haven't identified 
this dynamic of, of absorbing your partner's stress, you may subconsciously avoid romantic relationships or become attracted to unavailable people. This is because you're afraid of getting overwhelmed. And many people become attracted to unavailable people and have no idea why. A lot of people, uh, yeah. and, and or avoid uh, getting into it at all. Also, a healthy connection is when partners are mutually committed to the relationship and want to open their hearts to each other. In contrast, attachment is where you cling to someone with the death grip. <laughs> like that. The death grip, right? <laughs> hoping, the per hoping the person will change. Attachments right. are dangerous because they keep you linked to unavailable people or toxic relationships. If you are looking for intimacy, search out people who are excited to be with you. A, yes, yes, okay. yes. But talk about healthy connection uh, with partners uh, that uh, that really are unafraid to open up their hearts to each other. Right. Well, the, the key for an empath, the, the magic phrase is, I need some alone time and having your partner go beautiful, enjoy. I mean, that's a magical interaction for an empath, as opposed to, I thought we were going out in an, an hour. You're saying you need alone time? That's not going to work. Not going to work. And um, so it's a very magical thing for in partnership for the other person to recognize and empath needs a lot of alone time. It might be different than you are. You might not need that. You might feel lonely when you're alone, you know, to that degree. I mean, I could go days, you know, I have gone days writing a book and not even talking to anybody, you know, and I'm pretty good with it. <laughs> I'll go to the beach, you know, and the ocean is, is, the ocean was my companion for so many years, my primary companion. You know, but if you want to be in a relationship, which I do, because it's a beautiful thing, the love, the companionship, the growth, the depth, the passion, the, the, the friendship, the fun. I mean, there's so much I love about being in a relationship. It's really worth it to me to expand my skills as an empath to include intimate love. I really want that in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you also talk, of course, uh, about, again, I everything you say, I cannot, in, in my mind, it seems to me to just apply to, to anyone. Anyone can t take this advice. Yes, of course, there's a higher level, uh, there's a more specific level, shall we say, in terms of an, an empath and their needs right. and, and, and the things that uh, are really difficult for them to navigate. Right. But those things, people you know, need for intimacy, need to open up in a certain way, need for uh, being able to, I mean, you just say things to me like, I absolutely need to have a long time. And, yes. uh, and so does my wife. And so we, yes. we give ourselves that space. So, uh, and then... That's uh, so beautiful. I can't tell you, as an empath, my heart just says, thank you. You know, thank you for all of womankind and empath kind that you can do that for each other. It's just so beautiful to me. I mean, the strength of my reaction as an empath, empaths love that. If their mates can just allow that, you know, graciously and excitedly, you know, without feeling resentful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it is a great thing that we do have. Uh, there's, there's, you do talk about uh, empaths and, and having a family and children and so on. Um, yeah. Actually, Judith, I'm going to put you on hold for one second because Doggy wants to go out. Okay. <laughs> okay, see what you've done to our podcast? <laughs> oh. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Um, it's from Jung. I just love this quote from Jung. As a child, I felt myself to be alone, and I am still, because I know things and must hint at things which others apparently know nothing of, and for the most part do not want to know. Loneliness does not come from having no people about one, but from being unable to communicate the things that seem important to oneself or from holding certain views which others find inadmissible. What a great quote that is from you, huh? 
So beautiful, and it describes the sensitive person's conundrum growing up. I and mean, when I was a, an empath, empathic child, an intuitive child growing up, I felt like I was an alien from outer space. I couldn't relate to the human race. I couldn't relate to my family. I had all these needs nobody understood, and I did not fit in anywhere. You know, and I, honestly, I still don't feel like this is my primary home here. However, I don't. I, you know, that's fine. What do you mean by this? What, what do I mean by you that? Don't, you don't feel this is your primary home? No, not really. Um, I think there's a place other than Earth where everything I'm talking about is just part of the flow, where you don't have to fight it or convince other people of it. It's just simply a way of being, and it's a way of, of collective family. And, you know, and I, I, I do think, you know, because I had a dream when I was 21, and I was told by a voice that my role here was to legitimize intuition in traditional medicine, that I'm, you know, that is my mission here. I mean, I have a mission, and I'm happy to be here, and I have a soul growth mission here to learn all this stuff for myself, you know, and also help others. But as much, as much as I love the earth, there is another place that I exist that is more my home. And I've always known that. And it always seemed blue, like a blue place, you know, blue, the color blue. <laughs> and it, it's fine. You know, it's just fine. But, you know, and I feel more at home here than I ever have felt because you know, I've made it my own here. I was really angry. I was here for a lot of years when I was a child because it was so obvious I didn't really fit in. And I was so just me and nature, me and the moon. You know, I had one best friend, you know, all the time. I'd climb trees and look up at the moon, and that was my connection. But people and all those kids and what they did, it was just, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> too noisy. The whole world was too noisy for me. <laughs> blue is Krishna, the fellow. The god Krishna is blue. And that's a nice place. And I, you said that. I, I don't know why. I suddenly started thinking of Krishna and this, there's a city that we used yeah. to go to in India called Vrindavan where, where he used to cavort with the cow maids and the gopis, and they would follow him all around and around the Can you get a little bit away from the mic so I can hear you better? Oh, Thank sorry. You. So yeah. I, I can get, uh, so they would follow him all the way around as he, uh, uh, with, with the cavort by the banks of the Yamuna River. Right. So, yeah. That, that's a nice blue place. Actually. You have to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some empaths have very strong intuition and can have visions to guide their yeah. lives. So dream empaths, that, that was a fascinating part of the, of the book. Uh, I'd love for you to talk about that. Uh, because as, as you say, and we all know, dreams are a very powerful form of intuition uh, because they bypass the ego and the linear mind to offer clear, clear intuitive information. And this is... Um, so important, and I think uh, we talk about it all the time at the retreats we do, or, or if I'm just with people and they're asking questions about what it was like to be with Nimparoli Baba or you know whatever I've learned over the years, and certainly the connection to trusting the intuitive place deep yes. inside oneself is key, empath, sensitive person, or whatever. So, yeah, talk about the using dreams uh, to connect with that person. Yes, I mean, one of the types of empaths that I talk about in the book is a dream empath. And these are people who have a natural affinity for their dreams, and they love to remember their dreams. They love to follow their dreams' guidance. And usually as children, they've had you know, various dreams about spiritual revelation or some kind of intuitive guidance about their lives. Um, dreams are my most favorite form of intuition. I feel more comfortable in dreams than I do in the awake world. And if I don't dream, I just, you know, can't function very well. You know, I really need to sleep and dream. It was interesting when I went through my medical training at USC and UCLA and the VA, I would be on call every third night. And so I would have my sleep interrupted. I would have sleep deprivation. And I lost track of my dreams. Oh, it was so painful for me because it was just too many interruptions in my dream state. 
um, I would be woken up. I think we had beepers back then, you know, and you know, to pronounce someone dead. You know, let's say come down if I was working in hospice, you know, which I did in the VA. It was an amazing experience, but I have to pronounce someone dead and then go back to sleep again. <laughs> <laughs> how did I ever do it I have no idea <laughs> other than I was guided to do it you see but during that time I, I couldn't really remember my dreams and I felt something was really lacking and since I've been a little girl I've kept dream journals and I suggest that for everyone to keep a dream journal before you go to sleep at night if you're an empath or if you're just a dream lover um, you can ask a question before you go to sleep at night and then the first thing when you wake up between the hypnagogic state between sleep and waking, just lie there really relaxed and see what flashes come to you, see what knowing, see what guidance, see what emotions, and the most embarrassing, the most upsetting, write it down. Don't censor that, because a lot of my patients censor those things. <laughs> and you don't want to do that. You miss the point if you do that. And then you, you look at it and you know, if I have a dream, I say, how does this apply to my life today? And it's emotional healing dreams that I talk about where we're given, we're running, let's say, on the edge of a cliff and somebody's chasing us. And we keep running, 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 and we wake up and are terrified. We're terrified in the dream. And so that, to me, nightmares are healing to me. You know, they're upsetting, but they're extremely healing because they let you see who's chasing you and in the darkest recesses of your soul so you can heal that and deal with that. Whatever person, place, thing, you want to look at it in the eyes and let it heal it and let it go so you don't have that being chased feeling in your life that stops you from being in the now if you're constantly subterranean being chased by some pursuer and i believe dreams the threads of dreams stay with us throughout the day it's not like we just have the dream and then it's not with us it's a dream is representative of a resonance within us that's going constantly so you're out in your life trying to be successful or trying to be a good mate and underneath that is a repercussion of your being chased all the time. So I encourage everyone to deal with the dreams, scary, happy. Now, sometimes, you know, we have flying dreams, too. Now, children often have flying dreams, and that's just representative of how radiant and wide and huge our soul is, that we can fly. You know, maybe not in the intellectually framed way. We can't really analyze it, but we can in dreams. We can fly. You see, so we have that capacity. So that that's why I love dreams. And some empaths are really dream empaths, and they get their information through dreams as opposed to telepathy, which is mind-to-mind -mind communication or precognition. Some empaths can predict the future, which is problematic because a lot of the futures are scary. And then they think they caused it, and yeah. they didn't cause it. So, you know, the book really walks you through all of the fears and the misconceptions. And I work with all my empath patients. I have a great deal of my practice is made up of empaths and oh. sensitive people. Yeah. And, you know, we're all consolingly similar in these respects. You know, there are really some common bonds among sensitive people, empaths, or intuitive people. You know, where we have the same kind of challenges so we can help one another in it. And those who have gone down the path can say, oh, yeah, I went through that phase where I thought I was causing everything I predicted. But, you know, I learned I wasn't. And then I was just in a witness state, a deep seeing state with a capital S. And that's a beautiful light bearing state. And I have to deal with my codependency issues or I can't fix everything in the world, even though I pick up something. So isn't that an amazing inquiry to just even think about any of that? To me, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you, when you're working with people, how do you uh, help them to train themselves to not only be able to remember their dreams, say, but maybe even have some, you know, some Tibetan dream yoga consciousness in a dream, so that you you have an actual awareness. Do you do you work with that at all? With, uh, I do. I I do. Um, it's all about awareness everywhere we go. And if you begin to look at dreams as states of consciousness that you travel to, and it's a frequency that you need to harmonize with while you're in it, then you could become one with it. And you don't look at it as just I'm going to sleep and my brain is doing some recreation and resting and creative problem solving. I mean, that's true. You do all that in, in dreams and when you sleep. 
But my, my, in my dream state, I'm also able to travel and I'm also able to communicate with civilizations and people and, and layers of consciousness that I can't contact, you know, in my intellectual everyday life, usually, you know, unless you, you can, <laughs> which some people can too. Well, um, well, that's the goal is to have the veil lifted. But let's say you can just do it in dreams. You can program yourself in your dream to be aware in your dream by making a deep prayer and saying before you go to sleep, I would like to be aware and conscious in this dream. And so it's a practice. It's a dream practice for empaths and others to maintain an awareness in the dream. The part I have trouble with with a lot of the lucid dreaming people is that they feel you can change the ending of a dream and all is well. No, they do. They really, really? They go in. A lot yeah. of people do this, yeah, because you can do it. You can go into a nightmare and you can say, no, I don't want that ending and I'll make a happy ending. But to me, that doesn't fix the issue. It fixes the dream at the moment, but it doesn't fix the basic issue right. that How that's manifesting. Calling the dream is begging you to look at. So I, I don't really believe in changing the endings of dreams, that that will change the dynamic that's going on in you. I don't think that that will happen. Right. <laughs> Right. Wonderful. Um, animal impacts. This struck me because I particularly love animals. Yeah. Uh, as you may have heard them. Uh, around me. Where did he go? <laughs> I, I put it out. <laughs> she went off with her other friends. There's four of them here. Uh, and I certainly can. I'm, I'm alone with them a lot because I work from home. Right. right. And so uh, I, uh, I would say, oh, and there was just this thing of, um, they just said that animals absolutely do understand and certainly understand tone and intent with people. And uh, so I, uh, yeah, I, I feel like that's certainly part of my makeup as well. And, and I think many people, and I think it's very uh, productive for some, a lot of people, and of course there's a lot of pet owners in America, that's for sure, or in the West, or anywhere. Uh, but for a lot of people, that's probably something uh, that is a positive in their lives and, and enhances their lives. Oh, yes. I mean, there's all kinds of pet therapies in hospital for drug addicts and the elderly. And also, interesting work is in prisons with sociopaths and narcissists who have, quote, empathy deficient disorders, which I talk about in the book, but the way they help them with that, and that's very hard to help, is to bring in pets so that they mm. can keep about an animal and actually be invested in love and have compassion for something. Right, yeah. But well, a lot of empaths, I have to say, you know, I write about animal empaths in the book, that they are into animal rescue, they often have you know, really devotion to the animal kingdom. And I write about how St. Francis is an animal empath. You know, he used to take lots of time of seclusion, but with his animals. Um, and in his meditation retreats, he wasn't with people. And he could communicate with the animals and indeed tame the wolf and gave sermons to the fish and to, you know, the deer. And they would all gather around and listen. You know, how natural is that? It's beautiful to communicate with animals like that. And empaths, some empaths really have a deep ability to do this in terms of being animal communicators. And they can help heal the animal when others cannot reach into the soul of the animal to find out what's really bothering them. Um, empaths, animal empaths can get in there and go, I think this is what the mm -hmm. animal needs, whether it's mm -hmm. diet or change of, you know, sleep cycle, whatever they need. But it's a beautiful ability, and empaths typically love animals and are involved in pet grooming and you know, all kinds of animal activities. And a lot of the people in my empath group are deeply devoted to the well-being of animals. I think before we leave, and we're getting close to the end of the show, uh, there's one I feel, and it's, it's funny because it's at the... Well, it's funny, it's at the beginning of the book where I thought, well, oh, this might be a, a nice conclusion. And and to me, this is a tremendous advice, again, as far as I'm concerned, for everybody, and that's finding solace in spirit. And uh, I, I, I think you're, you're referring here, of course, to uh, talking about it, addicts and of all sorts, right? 
Um, but I think for just the general day-to-day suffering that everyone goes through, and it doesn't have to be just addiction, I think finding that place is, is super important. But talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so I, I wrote about it in the chapter on empaths and addiction because many empaths go into addiction and alcoholism um, because they're so sensitive and they want to you know, numb themselves out because the world is just too much to take. And part of recovery from that in 12 programs or otherwise is connecting to spirit. And spirit is something that is so basic in terms of your everyday existence, um, you know, entering the kingdom of heaven every day, to be able to connect with a higher power greater than the self. I mean, there are all kinds of descriptions of what this is, or nature, or love, or compassion. What happens when you close your eyes put your hand on your heart, and you're able to slow your thoughts enough to change channels and be able to feel a reality larger than this world, which is inherently love. No, it wronged us. Yeah. You know? <laughs> his brilliant. life is he's like, he's like my love guru. I mean, just visiting him, just being around him, I just melt with all the love mm. he gives off. But that's spirit. He's a conduit for spirit. Ram Das is emanating what I'm suggesting everyone contact within themselves and without. You know, as you know, many you know amazing people have said, the spirit of kingdom. This is within and without. Yeah. You know, it's it's. But the way I get there, the what I teach in my workshops and in the book is you start through the heart, through the power of the heart. And the heart chakra is a very real energetic center right here in the middle of the chest. And so I teach all my patients, or I work on them energetically to open up their heart chakra. So you can feel it's literally bliss, healing, and total acceptance and forgiveness. And everything that you you strive for is energetically within your own body in this heart chakra. And as an empath, you certainly want to develop access to that energy. And when you work through your body to connect and then use that heart chakra as an extension to tune into a larger um, spirit where that's your connecting point, then on a daily practice, if you connect with this, it soothes you, you find solace in it, you know there's something more than this world, you can replenish yourself, and you could keep learning more about the mystery. I mean, you never know, you never fully get it. I mean, how could you? I mean, you can know, for me, it's in the small moments of interaction, you get this, oh, you know, this is a connection of love. And this to me is the ultimate, you know, as an empath, as a loving person, as a spiritual seeker, the more you can find it and consciously generate it in yourself to find the solace of spirit, the more protection you're going to have and more solace you'll have. Beautiful. Love that. Hey, what about in this book, uh, you suggest, uh, I think, a little heartbeat meditation. Mm-hmm. Do not, how about doing a little few-minute thing to end our session here? Do you mind? Three minute to, to open your heart meditation? Yep. Sure. All right. If everybody can now close your eyes and take a few deep breaths and begin to focus on the in-breath and the out-breath. Just focusing on the sensations of the in-breath and the out-breath. And when thoughts go by in your mind, just picture them as clouds in the sky and return your consciousness and awareness to the breath. Do not try and shut off your mind. Just refocus on your breath and begin to focus also on your heart chakra, which is in the center of your chest, um, above your solar plexus, about three inches. And you might even want to put your heart, uh, your hand over your heart right there, and begin to feel sensations of unconditional love or warmth, soothing. Even the slightest sensations are the most beautiful and mystical and loving. And just feeling the heart chakra like a little sun, the warmth, getting more and more expansion, soothing, loving, connecting. And just spend time dropping into that 
feeling of the heart and then notice if it extends up your chest and out your shoulders and down your arms and out your hands so that there's a channel of love going from your heart through your shoulders and arms and hands and then out into the universe circulating that love and then reconnecting with the love that's all around you and bringing it back through the crown into the heart and just feeling that circulation of love as it it gives you resilience and hope and strength and allowing you to take a deep breath to self-soothe and to give yourself a vacation from the material world in the world of the heart energy, the most precious and deep and soothing of all. And this is the home you want to return to again and again in your meditations, in your life, as a practice to be in the now, to be here now. And so if everyone just takes a little bow of gratitude for that experience and slowly open up your eyes and come back to this room and with us um, and this conscious awareness we've created with this show, Um, all of us together taking the sustenance from our interaction with us to our daily lives. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful hour. Judith, as it always is. Um, I've totally enjoyed it. Oh, it's very great. Oh, how Thanks could you found us? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. What, uh, for people to reach you again, website? Oh, my website is um, drjudithorloff.com, O R L O F F.com. And the name of the book is The Empath Survival Guide. Um, it's on Amazon and um, is available. But this book, the the uh, sounds true book, yes, is uh, that's going to come out in a more extensive form next year. Yes, it's pre-order now, and there's an audio companion program that goes along with it that you can uh-huh. download um, or get in CD form, which is the spoken voice. And then next year, I'm also going to be giving an empath online course oh, really? for those for like eight weeks of interaction with me once a week on just really guidance on how to be an empath and develop protective tools and enjoy your gifts. The key word is enjoy. (laughs) Well, we're going to, you're going to hear all about that on the be here now network. When, uh, when this all happens, we're going to let everybody know, Judith, you're going to let us know, of course, we can put it all up there and uh, help get the word out. And uh, again, thank you so much uh, for, for this, uh, being able to sit with you like this and get all this wonderful information and share the way that you share. It's, it's really uh, great. It's my pleasure. It's always so good to see you and talk to you. <laughs> we'll see you next time on Mind okay. Rolling.